welcome to the Breakout Growth Podcast, where Sean Ellis and Ethan Gar interview leaders from the world's fastest growing companies to get to the heart of what's really driving their growth. And now, here are your hosts, Sean Ellis and Ethan Gar. All right, in this week's episode of the Breakout Growth Podcast, Ethan Gar and I chat with Sandeep Choksi, Chief Technical Officer at Harry's. There's a good chance that you know Harry's. Uh, they've disrupted the world of consumer packaged goods by offering quality razors for men that you could order and refill on a subscription basis over the internet. So when, when we booked Sandeep, we were hoping to learn more about kind of what a CD, CTO does and talk about technology's role in Harry's success and maybe tie that a bit in with growth. But I'd say, like, as, as we dug into it, this was really just the beginning. Uh, the conversation quickly evolved into how great companies build disruption into their DNA and how they view the world. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. So, so Ethan, what do you think is going to surprise our listeners? Uh, cat food. I think cat food <laughs> is definitely going to be the big surprise. Um, but, uh, I, and I'll explain. But coming into the conversation, you know, it, what didn't surprise me is that Harry's already had a brand for women called Flamingo. I mean, yeah. You know, why wouldn't you extend your reach to a broader audience in a category where you've developed, you know, a playbook for finding product market fit and where you already have that existing infrastructure and even the manufacturing capabilities. But when Sandeep told us how Harry's had also just acquired a cat food brand, that's when it hit me that they really are building this extensible growth engine for really rapidly deploying consumer packaged goods uh, of all sorts. And, um, you know, they have this digital infrastructure that gives them that disruptive edge. And I'm guessing that the Proctors and Gambles of the world are probably already taking notice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, Sandeep mentioned that they were recently valued at 1.7, which on 1.7 billion dollars, which on one hand is a is a really big number, yeah. but on the other hand, you know, some of these CPG companies are the real big ones are valued in the hundreds of billions of dollars, yeah. and uh, and and I and I do think they're taking notice. Yeah, Harry is just Harry's is just looking at the world so differently. Yeah, Sandeep tells us that uh, Harry's team can spin up not just the e-commerce site, but by starting direct to consumer, they can quickly validate and optimize their offerings before moving to an omni-channel approach. So you know, if you if you look at traditional companies, you know, once that product's out there, they're they're really separated mm -hmm. from the customer from by by like the major retailers that are selling mm -hmm. their products. So Harry's just has a whole different way of doing things and and being able to experiment with offerings so quickly is is really game changing. It's I, I think it's like disruption in action. Yeah, and and obviously the technology is a huge part of that. Sandeep's responsible for the software engineering and the IT, but what he says he's really there to do is to figure out how to be omnichannel. And yeah. I know sometimes like, you know, you hear these words like omnichannel, digital transformations, the metaverse, and your head starts to spin because you're trying to like figure out like, is this just like the flavor of the moment? Is it just jargon or is it reality? But with, Harry, with Harry's, you can actually see and touch it. I mean, you can go to a drugstore drug or a Walmart or a Target and you can go online and have these connected experiences with the brands and you can start to really understand why and how this is going to shape the future. So, you know, but doing it, it, you know, it becomes a challenge, right? It's, we always say product market fit and the, and, and execution, that intersection is what matters. And totally. here it's really all about the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that part of the discussion. Yeah. He, he went into answering questions like how does Harry's align individuals and teams to the mission? How do the co-founders articulate that mission effectively? Mm -hmm. How do you get engineers to see the connection between the ticket they're working on and the value that ticket actually means to the customer shopping at Walmart? You know, Sandeep was just great about sharing how everything from hiring processes to goal settings, uh, goal setting ties into this like embrace the mammoth mindset yeah. that is powering Harry's growth. Yeah, it's totally awesome. And I, I, Sean, I'm not going to say it, but this is normally where I would tell you that this is one of my favorite episodes. You know, you just did it again, but <laughs> I'll, I'll admonish you later on that one. But uh, <laughs> before we jump in with Sandeep, we want to invite our listeners to check out the sponsor for this week's episode. SAP is the world's leading provider of enterprise application software, enabling hyper growth companies to scale quickly to achieve their growth ambitions with their agile, cost-effective, easy-to-implement cloud solutions. If you're working to power breakout growth success in your business, please check out sap.com slash SME. Very cool. And by the way, Sean, uh, did you tell me you have a new Go Practice course launching soon? 
Yeah, yeah, we uh, we're, we're really excited about it. It's um, this one's going to be a simulation that's focused on handling a growth stall. So yeah, keep an eye out for for more information on that one. Yeah, I think that a lot of companies go through those, so uh, that's <laughs> going to be very cool. All right, let's get started. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, Sandeep, welcome to the Breakout Growth Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, we're we're super excited to have you. I'm also joined by my co-host Ethan Gar. Hey, Ethan. Hey, Sean. Hey, Sandeep. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, Ethan. Yeah, so uh, we um, we were just talking as we got started. Uh, Sandeep's based in New York, and Ethan and I had our uh, first face to face meeting in a long time last week in New York. So it was it was cool to uh, not stare at Ethan through a computer. He's uh, <laughs> it's actually a good looking guy. The computer messes it up a bit. So. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, hey. But, but I'm not kidding that you're a good looking guy, but <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, Sandeep, you're the, you're the CTO of Harry's, um, it's, it's a not so traditional CPG company. Uh, I'm guessing that most of our listeners are going to be pretty familiar with Harry's, but, uh, for those who aren't, can you give us a, a quick introduction? Maybe what, what makes it unique? Yeah, of course we, we pride ourselves in being disruptive. Uh, so many of, many people probably know Harry's. As a razor company, they started about 11 years ago making razors, and the hypothesis was fairly simple, like, hey, uh, in this world, uh, when you walk into a shopping aisle, razors are sort of hidden. You've got to call someone to get a razor out. Mm -hmm. It's extremely expensive, and why do they need to be so expensive? The reality is that there's a, quite a bit of a monopoly in this razor world. Right. Uh, what if you try to disrupt that monopoly, uh, build uh, razors at, uh, build better razors, uh, reduce the margins, sell products directly online, cut out the middleman. What does it mean uh, to do that? And uh, lo and behold, very quickly, we took a pretty massive share uh, of the razor market. And then from there on, Harry's is sort of a model change for, from being a razor company to just create things people like more. And so that means expanding in a variety of new uh, categories, variety of new products. Uh, we went from being an online company to an omni-channel business. Okay. So our goal is to be anywhere a customer might want us. That includes uh, online, that includes offline and retail. Uh, and we use sort of what we did with Razors as our blueprint across a variety of new products. So we launched products online first. We okay. learned very, very quickly what it means to uh, build a good product. When you launch things online, you directly own that relationship. Uh, with the customer mm -hmm. and so you get a ton of feedback directly from right. the customer understanding uh, exactly what's working what's not working you're able to quickly iterate and so then by the time you launch it in retail you have a much more refined product that just sort of flies off the shelves and oh so that's super cool yeah, yeah. i've never made that connection <laughs> no and so we rinsed and repeated that model across a variety of categories now uh, we have uh, we have four brands. We sell in uh, maybe half a half a dozen countries, and uh, uh, it sort of works every every time. So, so besides goal, razors, yeah. what's what what would be a, another really popular product? That you guys yeah. Have? So so uh, if you if so we have four different brands. We have Harry's, which is a men's brand. We have Flamingo, which is a women's brand. Mm -hmm. We have uh, believe it or not, <laughs> most people are shocked when I say this. We have a cat food brand called Cat Person. Oh uh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, and then we also have a body odor brand uh, named Lumi, uh, uh, which was actually a recent acquisition. Ethan, uh, write that down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and within, uh, wow. within Harry's, uh, we, have, uh, we have actually a body wash that is flying off the shelves right now. It's doing really, oh, really cool. well. Uh, but even our Flamingo brand is pretty massive now. Uh, Cap Person is only online. So that's a perfect example of something we've launched online in the last few years, we're mastering it, perfecting it. Eventually, one day we'll hit uh, hit retail. And I love too is only yeah. online right now. I just I love that uh, the the ability to to really dial in the product with a direct relationship with the customer before you push it out to the channel. I used to I used to have a uh, qualitative insights business and and. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a big I'm a big qualitative guy, yep. in, in addition to being sort of data driven with what I do, and um, it's it's really hard when you're when you have channel partners that sit between you and, yep. and the and the customer. So that's that's a, a, a great dynamic to the business. I would have never thought of. Yeah, and Sean, as like as as you can imagine, like uh, you know, to test something online, whether the, let's say a value prop, right? It's like a five minute thing, an A/B test that you can run. 
mm-hmm. that quickly tells you like what works and what doesn't versus actually changing the value prop and packaging is a whole, it's a right. whole different beast. Yeah, and yeah. so if you can get even like a, something as simple as your brand colors value prop right, you learn things very quickly and then you actually even get direct feedback on the product versus actually stalking people in a retail aisle trying to get understand why they might have picked something versus the other. That's great. I know Ethan's probably chomping at the bit to ask a question, but I just want to point out really fast the uh, I have not worked with a CTO that 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 speaks our language so much. So it's so <laughs> cool to hear you hear you talk about those things. But go yeah. ahead, Ethan. I, I'll let, let you. In yeah. <laughs> I, well, thanks. Yeah. I, um, I was curious, Andy. Like, no, when you say like a, you know cat food brand ver- and versus a men's brand, a women's brand, is there? What, what do you think gave the company the appetite to be that aggressive going, you know, so far afield of what you're, you know, that comfort zone of like, hey, we know men's healthcare or men's grooming and healthcare? Well, we, what we've realized is what differentiates us from traditional CPG is our digital capabilities, right? So we know that uh, we are extremely good at selling products online and quickly analyzing data. And we've built a pretty robust data platform where we can gather insights out of, right? And so we know what we've built is not specific to just personal care or razors. Uh, so what we what we did was we actually have Harry's Lab, which is a division within Harry's, which is constantly looking at what other categories there's white space or such disruption. And uh, Cap Person is, is, uh, is something like that that came out of incubation out of Harry's as an area where we could try something new we could be disruptive. We could launch a better product than what was out there in the market. Uh, and so we, we've we essentially figured out how to use our skills that already exist in the organization and to just apply it to newer areas where there's a ton of white space. So I, I want to ask you about your background and what led you there. Um, but <clears throat> I, with that, um, in our uh, initial conversations, you mentioned CPG 2.0. And I'm guessing that when you talk about disruption and uh, your ability to use digital capabilities. I'm guessing that's what uh, CPG 2.0 is, but for us and for our listeners, can you give us what your, your, your definition of it and what that means? And- yeah, for, for sure. For one, I mean, CPG 2.0, if you just look at it from a channel perspective, we are on the channel. So our goal is to be anywhere a customer I'd look for us, right? That's, that's just part one. Uh, the other ways we think about it is like, okay, how good are we at selling in those channels? So if I look, use online as an example, um, uh, if, if, uh, if we are thinking about incubating a new brand, we are able to very, very quickly spin up an e-commerce site that is selling the product online within like days when something like an old school CPG company might take six months a year, right? So when you talk about the speed of execution, that also is what we call CPG 2.0. For us, the cost of doing this quick rapid experimentation is so low that we're able to try out so many, so many different things so fast, spin up sample ads to see whether people would click through on it. If you want to acquire a customer online, Sean, you come from a growth background. Like if you want to acquire a customer online, is this what the unit economics of this business even make sense? What would be the customer acquisition cost? So we can do a lot of that so quickly without actually even investing millions of dollars in a supply chain or like in mm. or like begin to actually build a product. And so that is what makes us CPG 2.0 is essentially we're omni-channel. We're really good at selling things online. We've mastered even retail now, but also the idea of like, how do you then figure out what to do next? purely based on the capabilities you've built. I'm scared how much uh, of our language you're speaking here. Um, so, I mean, you sound less like a tech guy, more like a growth guy, uh, the way you're describing it, which is, uh, which is I, I, and I think that's part of what we're going to discover here is that the lines are getting blurrier and blurrier every day. But, you know, tell, can you tell us your responsibility as a CTO in driving growth and explain sort of your relationship to, to growth? Because it sounds like it's where your heart is. Yeah, uh, uh, Ethan, Sean, this is, Harry's is my fifth e-commerce subscription business that I'm joining. So it's definitely not my first rodeo. And uh, 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 to answer your question a little bit, today at CTO, today as a CTO at Harry's, by the way, I was the first, I'm the first ever CTO hired at Harry's. Mm. Uh, And so uh, my, I oversee two main parts of the organization. One is software engineering. Basically, the team that over that that uh, that run all our 
online e-commerce storefronts. And then I oversee IT. Uh, ITO essentially oversees uh, uh, our, our enterprise system. So if you think about ERP, right, we've got, we've got retail plumbing with almost all the large retailers in the United States. So all the enterprise systems that manage that plumbing, I oversee that as well. And, mm. the, and my role, the goal for me being hired was essentially to figure out how to truly be omnichannel from a technology perspective, bringing these two things together, selling products online and selling products in retail shouldn't feel like two-way disjointed parts of the organization should be, should be something that has more synergy. Uh, the reason, uh, 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 the reason you hear me talk a lot about growth as if I were the CTO is because I've over the time realized that a key part of my role is not just to build technology as a means to, ship a product right a lot of my the beginning of my career uh, i was selling software as a service right so mm -hmm. i was selling whether it be an online video builder or digital assets or or audiobooks so i have essentially learned what it means to sell these digital products online and i'm just replicating a lot of that now selling physical products right mm -hmm. but the basic concepts remain the same so i look at technology as like hey how can i use technology not just as a way to sell something online but also truly have it be a differentiator such that your competitors can steal your products, but they can't steal how fast you're moving or right, they can't right. steal how quickly you're launching something. And so that becomes your competitive advantage. That's why I like a lot of my focus is on like, hey, how can we improve unit economics for customers going through our funnel mm -hmm. uh, by launching maybe a brand new way of discovering the product or a Do quiz or something like that? Yeah, did you have a CPG background before, or just an e-commerce background? Uh, I I have done one other uh, physical product company before this, which was uh, a company called Carof, uh that was acquired by Bayer. But prior to that, only I, my uh, the beginning of my career was at the likes of Microsoft and Amazon. Oh, okay. Uh, so most of my career has been selling software. So when you yeah. uh, when you say you were the first CTO there, um, what what did the, the what did the kind of the growth organization look like before? Was it was it more of a traditional kind of marketing setup, or is there a head of growth? Is there yeah? There is yeah. How do those there, kind of fit there, together? Yeah, there is a. We have a whole growth marketing division that focuses okay. purely on figuring out how we can uh, uh, grow our online sales. Okay, and so yeah. obviously, like with with growth teams, most of the time there's a bit of tension with the yeah. uh, kind of technology side where. You know, we, we want to run tests at, at, at the fastest speed we can. And, and on the technology side, it's like, guys, it's going to take us time to build this right. And we got to put it through quality control. How, how do you reconcile those things? The fact that I'm hearing you talk about the need for speed and, and that being a, a big competitive advantage in the business, I'm, I'm assuming that you found some good ways to, uh, to have to find that balance. Yes, we have, we have honestly an amazing head of growth that has built a pretty great growth function. And uh, uh, they've essentially, for what it's worth, like even before I started, they essentially built their own set of tools and infrastructure to work around many of my teams. Right. And, and, and as you can imagine, a lot of engineers and technology are very territorial. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. tend to be that. I, I think of it as like, hey, they've built tools to work around engineering is because we're not meeting some of their needs. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you have that sense of empathy in the end, if you're aligned at the goal level, it's like, hey, they're trying to grow the business. We're trying to grow the business. If you can get aligned on that, you build a lot of empathy for what they're doing. And then if you can just figure out, like, okay, what exactly are you trying to do? All right, you want to build a landing page generator so that your team can crank out landing page after landing page after landing page. Mm -hmm. Let my team help you do that. Do, do you have any tips for, for how, uh, how growth people should communicate with technology, uh, the technology side of the business to, to build that empathy? Um, I, w I have tips for how engineering should communicate with <laughs> growth teams for sure. Uh, look, I, I think what you caught on early on is that uh, it helps when engineering understands how parts of the business work, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that if an engineering leader understands what LTV and CAC is and what unit economics of a subscription business should look like, they quickly start building empathy for what is a growth team trying to do. They're not just trying to like bring on marketing partner after marketing partner because uh, they get some unseen pleasure out of it. They're essentially trying to figure out new and creative ways to attract customers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you can play a role in that journey, 
it actually becomes more you engineers themselves get to solve interesting problems. So my mm-hmm. advice to the growth teams would be to actually bring engineers as rather than assuming that engineers aren't interested, bring them into the sausage making like, hey, here's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to build. Here's the problem I'm looking to solve. If I can move this numerator by X or move this denominator by Y, here's what I will, here's a, what we'll get out of it and let engineers be a part of the ideation. Mm-hmm. And the Dude. best growth engineering teams that I've seen are ones where like A-B tests and ideas are coming from engineers, product managers, growth marketers, yeah, that, everyone together. That was definitely the dynamic that we we built at, at Dropbox in the early days where, um, you know, that it it is really math at the end of the day and engineers tend to be really good at math. And so yeah, when you... Yeah. Uh, when you see when you see the impact on on the the output of growth with with creative tests and identifying bottlenecks to growth, uh, I, I find engineers come up with often some of the most creative ideas to uh, to drive growth. In fact, I, w- I would say by the time I left Dropbox, the majority of ideas came from the engineers in in the business and not marketers. Agree. Yeah. Do Do you um do you kind of directly assign some of your engineers to the growth team, like to, to sit on, uh, is it on a, either on a per project basis or over, you know, overall by teams? How do, like, how do you, how do you divide that up? We actually do the growth. So what, what, what exists at Harry's today is we actually have the growth team has its own dedicated engineer today that actually reports into the growth organization, doesn't even report into me. And that what? person works directly with some of the engineering team that we have on my side. In previous organizations, we had, at previous companies, we actually had dedicated engineers. There was a growth team with a gro- with head that reported into the head of growth, but had engineers loaned out to them. So I've seen both models work. I always say like, uh, you know, for companies our size, Harry's is about, if you, if you ignore our factory in Germany, we're about like a few hundred employees. Work charts really like really don't mean much, right? Like the fact that someone's reporting it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be working with the team here, right? Mm-hmm. They, in fact, that's what gives us the speed and agility that a larger company lacks. And so from my point of view, at my previous jobs, we had engineers on the growth team that were dedicated, that were part of the engineering organization. Today, we have one growth engineer that's in growth. It's not a part of the engineering organization, but works closely. And in both cases, it works because at the top, you have a head of growth and head of technology that are tightly aligned as to what they want to achieve as a business. If our incentives are aligned, it usually works regardless of the org chart. Do, do you think that's something that that the CEO has has helped to create there by by really kind of emphasizing the unique strengths of the business and the mission and 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 kind of getting everybody on the same page of that shared mission? Or has that been more on the kind of departmental level where that, that thinking's baked in? I, I would say both. I mean, disruption is in our DNA. Like just yesterday, we were talking about our mission and vision and how it should evolve as the company evolves. And one of the things we, that we talked at, at length about was how important was it to make sure employees always knew that what made Harry's Harry's was the fact that we always thought outside the box. We were mm-hmm. always looking to be disrupted. In fact, we attract a lot of ta- talent from traditional CPG companies that want to work at Harry's because Harry's is disruptive. Right, right. right. And so I think that that, that message or that uh, that uh, uh, ch- charter from up top helps a lot in making sure everyone understands that whatever the status quo might be, we have to find ways to challenge it. So even in our values, we talk about like one of our values is embrace the mammoth, which is about hey, like have difficult conversations, challenge each other. So that mm-hmm. is that it that basically manifests itself in a variety of ways that encourages such behavior. And is there any kind of like company wide metric that that sort of helps to to drive alignment? You know, a lot of times when you have these individual mm-hmm. goal metrics, it, it can it can drive things in different directions. But uh, it, are you guys using something like that? We I, we have company wide goals that okay. everyone is essentially ladders up to, so okay. that usually helps. Like every year, and we're we're in goal setting season right now. Andy and Jeff, who are co founders, co CEOs said they share like here are the top four priorities for the business and here are the metrics that we're going to track right okay and they could be anything from uh the number of retailers you might look to launch in to like the how much they want the 
core business to grow by, right? And so it can be a mix of leading indicators and lagging indicators. <laughs> and then we take those and figure out how are we going to build our activities that ladder up to those metrics. And so if I know Harry's, let's say Harry's.com is the core Harry's brand needs to grow by X, right? That mm -hmm. is the goal I share with the head of growth as well that is focused on the Harry's brand. And so then collectively we figure out how do we grow that business. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You mentioned you, it's, you know, you yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. You mentioned you attract, you know, disruptive people, right? People who have disruptive um, goals, you know, in mind. Um, as on the engineering side, like, what do you look for as you're hiring people to know if they're going to be good Harry's material if they're going to live that sort of, you know, disruptive edge? Yeah. Um... Look, many of our like, of course, there's the technical skills, right? Many of our engineers sure. could work at the likes of like a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook, but are choosing to come to essentially uh, what I will say a mid-sized company uh, or a smaller company because they're looking to have a broader impact, right? They don't want to just work on this one API or on this one page on this website that has millions of pages and be and not really know what customer impact they're having. They don't want to work on widgets. And so for us, like a lot of our engineers essentially have that sense of like think big mentality already of like, hey, like I want to own the whole piece. I want to understand what I'm doing, how it is impacting the broader picture. In fact, if I get disconnected from the broader picture, I'm not going to be happy, right? So yeah. they feel this craving to be connected with how are they impacting the broader impact. So we look for specific like technical skills where they should be, of course, Agile, nimble, but also be able to build things to scale because our business, our online business, especially, uh, and our IT systems are scaling pretty rapidly as the business grows. But then we look for that be those behavioral attributes. One of our values is like look left to find right. Like how can you be, how can you build things for scale, but also like find creative solutions to be able to move fast, right? Which you will always need if you're if you're looking to like growth hack things together. So it's a mix of like behavioral as well as like a lot of technical skills. So I was going to ask you, you know, how do you prevent like your engineers from feeling like they're just, you know, here to like, here's the next ticket. You know, my job is to close the next ticket, close the next ticket. It sounds like the way, the way you're from the way you're talking, the way to do that is to make them connected to the mission, help yeah. them feel connected to the mission, let them know where, how, what they're doing is valuable to end users. Um, but is there, do you think there's things that Harry's does really well in terms of how you organize your teams, how you empower your teams that helps them uh, to really feel connected all the time? Yeah, our, our teams are standalone. So let me give you a Flamingo example. Our, we have Flamingo, as you know, is our women's razor brand, shopflamingo.com. And it's a handful of engineers, a product manager, a designer. Basically, all the skills that you need to be able to iterate on that product of, as a startup of its own. We don't tell them what to build. We don't tell them uh, how they should do their job. They're essentially an autonomous unit that does that has some guide ra guardrail. They have goals. They know what direction they need to move in, right? So that the guardrail might be like, "Hey, we really we're we're uh, we really need to go or grow our subscriber base, right?" So uh, Flamingo has a lot of like a la carte purchases, but we're moving more towards subscription. How do we make it? How do we make uh, uh, the subscription experience more engaging? Right. Yeah. And so that's their charter. We give them some guardrails and then everything else comes from them. So they're ideating. They're the ones figuring out what are the right things to build. And then they're the ones quickly, rapidly iterating, executing, measuring success and and reporting back on it. So giving that team everything they need and it's a standalone unit helps quite a bit. But so how do you share those learnings, though, across the larger organization? Because like I the company uh, Teltech that I used to be a part of. Uh, we were a portfolio company. We had multiple mm -hmm. apps. And one of the things that we really tried as a growth team to focus on was like, hey, it's okay to make mistakes, but we want to make sure that we share those mistakes across the whole, the entire team, across the portfolio, so we only make them once. So how do you make sure that the learnings in Flamingo or the her learnings in Harry or the learnings in the cat side of the business uh, get shared so that you are, you know, you're, you're getting the best out of everybody? Yeah, it's definitely a lot easier when you're smaller and gets more and more challenging as you get bigger. Uh, as of right now, we have the heads of growth and the product managers on those teams meet. I believe they meet biweekly and they actually share their experiment calendar and the findings that they're having such gotcha. that uh, you can essentially replicate the learnings across all brands. 
The other thing that we actually do from a technology perspective is we've sort of built this like <laughs> shared front end infrastructure where you, earlier I was mentioned like we can spin up an e-commerce site with like you tell me like what the name of the brand is, what the colors are, what the uh, what the typography is, and we can actually spin spin up an online e-commerce site in production fairly quickly because we've built this like shared a backend platform and a front end platform. So what we do is we also take like these learnings, like, okay, what is an ideal checkout page and build it into our front end component library, into our front end uh, system such that if something works on one, it's being contributed, it's being contributed back to the front end platform and then it's just being replicated across all the other brands. Cool. So it's both technology as well as just humans coming together. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so, you know, as you, as you've kind of talked through the business, I, I, I have a new appreciation for the model and, and, and I feel like I also understand some of the other companies that are trying to do similar things. And, um, and it makes sense why, why the, the consumer package goods are, are kind of right for this disruption for, for all the, for all the benefits you talk about that system of, of, you know, direct to consumer first, really dial it in. If omni-channel makes sense, great. If you want to stay direct to consumer, great. Better margins that way anyway. Um, I'm, I'm curious as more and more companies are, are kind of honing in on that as a, as a better way to do innovation, how do you, how do you stay ahead of the game? How do you, how do you, how do you ultimately um, remain competitive if, if the cat's out of the bag that that's a pretty good, pretty good way to, to introduce uh, new disruptive uh, products into the market? I, I would say the cat's already out of the bag because we do already see a lot of traditional uh, retail companies have uh, online stores and they're trying to sell online. The, the difference between any two companies these days uh, tends to be the people. And so yeah. we focus heavily, heavily on people. From the very first day at Harry's, we've been a people first company. We truly believe that more than more important than the products that we sell are the people that we're doing our work with. And so uh, everything from uh, the employee experience, engagement with them, return. I was talking about the top five priorities as a business. One of those always is like, what is the company engagement score going to be? What are mm -hmm. we tracking towards? It is a top level company goal. And so for us, we continue to hire and retain a certain type of person, high caliber individual that is willing to disrupt his aligned with us from a values perspective becomes extremely important. And, and do you feel like you have a, a good way of, uh, of identifying those people before they come in the organization? Or is that a little bit of uh, A-B testing as well that you, <laughs> you think you have it and, and they either thrive or, uh, or, or find something that's better suited for their uh, approach to things? I, look, I've been, look, I've been here for about a year now. I've been at Harris for about a year. And I'm mostly involved with uh, either exec hiring or tech hiring. Uh, and I can say we've mastered it pretty well. Okay. Uh, and so we've done a pretty good job at it. Uh, and I do think it's, it's something we've mastered because we've been, we have been around for about a decade. Uh, and from the very first, very beginning, we've had, we've had a pretty strong head of people, uh, our chief people officer that has focused on that. Uh, both the founders also are heavily, for every new hire in Harry's goes to interview training. Okay. Regardless. So we teach people how to interview for the skills that we're looking for. And so that is a part of, just like they're learning how to onboard onto our code base, mm -hmm. they're learning how to onboard on, uh, onto our hiring processes. It's, it's, a, it's a must. You cannot interview at Harry's unless you've gone through that training, right? Cool. And, and it's and, a training that's tailored to us. Yeah, and are you, uh, are you guys um, like working on site together? Is it a, is it a hybrid? Is it, is it all remote? What, how's that working? It's hybrid. So most yeah. of the company comes in uh, two days a week. Uh, but some teams like engineering were a hundred percent remote. So okay. we have a few of us that come in because they want to, but, uh, we're mostly remote. And, and were, were you guys organized that way pre pandemic or is that that's no. more of a transition? It's more of a transition as we've all learned new ways of working. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course the market dynamics have changed. Right. Uh, we've sort of moved into this hybrid model. And do you feel like that there's any challenges on that kind of employee engagement with with that model, or or that that you're you're really finding a, a good stride with that model as well? We're seeing success, but it is not a slam dunk for sure. Yeah, yeah. we're all trying to figure out new and creative <laughs> ways of keeping like 
keeping employees engaged. You know, what keeps people at companies are sometimes are like being in the trenches together or those uh, yeah, water yeah. cooler conversations. Exactly. And like, how do you mimic that in a remote world? I, it's something I personally think about all the time. You start doing like, okay, let's do Zoom pasta making, but even that yeah. gets old after a while, <laughs> right? Like, like it doesn't it doesn't mimic those organic conversations. So engineering as an example, la- last week we brought all of engineering together okay. in New York and they spend a ton of time together. Yeah. So it's like, so so kind of making helps. up by doing kind of, off sites together, or kind of, kind of some some things yeah. where they do get that physical proximity. Yeah. But definitely still work in progress. It's something we are, like. I'm guessing every company in this world is trying to figure out is right. not just how to keep people engaged, but also help form that connected tissue that makes companies and forms culture. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and as CTO, is there is there any role role that you have in terms of like uh, finding tools that that you know technology solutions to to help that or is is that something that someone else is thinking about those kind of off the shelf uh, ways of, of potentially bridging the gap yeah the people team focuses heavily on that they're pretty creative they're all always looking at new ways to build engagement and so they work heavily on that i don't get too involved in that have, Unless... have you guys found as as harry's that that there's any kind of new emerging tools that have been helpful in in uh in bridging the gap or is it more kind of process and and just what you actively do to keep people plugged in. I can't say I found a, like a silver bullet tool yet. That's helping with that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I figured, I figured you might be the guy to ask. Cause it sounds yeah. like, it sounds like there's so, so much that's going well there that, uh, that, that there may have been uh, yeah. partly tools that are part of that, but it uh, doesn't, doesn't sound like it yet. <laughs> anyway. yeah, no, it's de- there's definitely a lot of trial and error. Okay. I'm, I'm fascinated by that too. Cause one, um, one of, um, our early guest, uh, Hugo Pereira, just today announced that he's uh, he's launching a business that's a uh, company engagement tool. So I'm so I'm curious. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about sort of how people are using those tools. What's working? What's not? So it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, so Sandeep, as you um, as you were talking about the, just the importance of getting the right people on on board, um, you mentioned you know really really tight and and well run hiring processes. I'm curious if there's, you know, a particular question that you you like to ask as in the hiring process uh, that you feel is really valuable, or if there's something that you do, whether it's a project that you you ask people to do that you feel has really worked well for Harry's. Yeah, uh, it, it, look, it really changes based on level, right? What I am typically looking for uh, are engineers. Uh, if I, if I'm hiring for engineering, as an example, I am looking for engineers that are not necessarily like cash motivated, right? Like, yes, compensation is important. I don't want to ignore that, but I'm really looking for engineers that are coming in because they truly believe they will build, let's say the next Amazon, right? I, 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 I say this a lot and maybe I've overset it, but I truly think that, uh, you know, uh, Harry's is to razor or Harry's what books or toys were to Amazon, right? It's like it's like proving out a model and then replicating that. So our goal is not to sell as many razors as possible. Our goal is to essentially like disrupt CPG, right? And so that is a long term project. People that are usually extremely cash motivated uh, uh, are, are 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 not interested in equity. Are usually very very short term minded people that are coming yeah. in for like a as mercenaries looking to make a quick, looking to work for a year, two years and then leave. And so I try to figure out creative ways in which I can figure, I can like understand what are their like long-term incentives? What do they want? Are they coming for growth? Then Harry's is the place. Are they coming to make an impact? Then Harry's is the place. Do they truly believe that Harry's can disrupt and they want, they want more equity than Harry's is the place. And I think that's what I usually push for. Awesome. Um, so uh, it's a good kind of transition into into the future and 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 what's next. Obviously, some of the things you just talked about probably were were part of what excited you a year ago about joining Harry's. Um, what what excites you going forward? What do you what do you think some of the interesting challenges around the corner are going to be? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, this is just the beginning of the journey, right? So I talked about four brands in six countries, and what that essentially means is. There's a long way to go. We are, uh, our last valuation was, I believe, at a $1.7 billion, value, uh, billion dollar valuation. Our competitors that we compete with have hundreds of billion dollars in market cap, right. right? And so if you talk about the delta between us and them, 
it's a huge thing. So it's today it's about our, our, our focus is about building a platform that's efficient, that helps us build a sustainable and profitable business, right? And so that is what we're focusing on, focusing on like something that everything else can be plugged on top of. And after that, it's about plugging everything on top of it and really blowing this thing up. And, and so I think we haven't gotten to the point where we go from, uh, we will, maybe we'll go from four brands to seven brands in the next few years or eight brands in the next few years. But after that, you go from eight to 16, it sort of gets exponential. And so that is the part I'm also looking forward to. Mm-hmm. Do you want to ask the wrap up question, Ethan? I have one, one oh, question. You got something in before. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just curious when you say that, you know, you mentioned, you know, your competitors have hundreds of billions, which means, you know, there are other, there are other startups that are doing similar things to what, what you're doing. Um, yeah. It doesn't sound like that's who you think of as your competitors. It sounds like you're thinking of your competitors as a much larger world. I'm just, is that, is that top of mind for you? And who, like when you, when, when I say, who are your competitors, who do you immediately think of? Uh, I will Procter and Gamble, Unilever. If you look, if you look around your household, 90% of the companies are being sold by 90% of the pack products you have at home are sold by Procter and Gamble, Unilever, Johnson, Johnson, right? And so these are the companies I think of, but also like, I do think of the next Harry's that's going to disrupt us. Yeah. No doubt. Like you, like there will, there will be companies. And I hope there are that keep us on our toes that may, that make sure that we don't get complacent. We don't get stagnant. We've been very fortunate that we've enjoyed a lot of growth over the years. Uh, but, mm-hmm. and it's easy to get comfortable, but uh, like that would be like the death of disruption for us. So for us, mm-hmm. I do think of like, hey, it's always good when you have, Others trying to do what we did, and it keeps yeah. us on our toes and makes us move, keeps us moving forward. You know, the old "only the paranoid survive" uh, yeah. <laughs> is, uh, is, is a good good mindset to have. Um, so, yeah, we we do like to have one question. I've got I've got a bunch of takeaways I want to share after this, but we we have one question that we we like to uh, wrap up on, and and that's uh, what do you feel like you understand about growth now that that maybe you didn't understand before you got to Harry's or you know just in the last couple of years it's some new learning for you? Yeah, yeah. I, maybe maybe I'll rephrase it a little bit about what have I learned about my role in growth over uh-huh. over the years and. Uh, my first job, fresh out of college, uh, was at Microsoft. I worked on a flow charting software called Microsoft Visio. Uh, those of us that are older probably remember it, right? And uh, we're, we're that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it was about building features and functionality. And for me, the role of engineer was about building features and functionality, right? Uh, but as we move into this world where Technology is sort of everywhere. It's not just about productivity software, or it's not about just uh, uh, selling uh, digital products on it. It's everywhere. How does the role of technology change? Uh, and I think this is what I have learned is that for technology to be successful or for you to be successful as a technologist at any other company, if you can't understand what actually a business does, how it grows, you can actually understand the mechanics of what makes a business successful yes the product makes it successful but also what sells that product makes it successful if you can't figure that part it's, it'll be very hard to become successful as a technologist uh, there's very it. few companies out there today that are truly building uh what you can consider like state of the art that next technology innovation um, yeah. but most companies most technologists today are essentially building what everyone else is building so then the differentiator really becomes, okay, how well can you partner with the non-technologists and create that secret sauce to win? And so I right. think that becomes extremely important. That's cool. It's, yeah, that was one of my big takeaways when you were, when with everything that we went through is like bring, bring engineers into the sausage making process um, and don't just, don't just ask for an occasional task, but, but yeah. help them understand what you're, what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going about it. And, and they'll, they'll probably have a lot more meaning in what they're doing, but they'll also be able to contribute in ways that you may not have thought of. But when you take that and you attach it to the big picture, and then another one of my big takeaways is just the the overall system that that Harry's is building that that platform that you that you call it is uh, is is really cool. That is the differentiator. The, the The products tend not to be 
that differentiated, but the, but when you can, when you can dial them in a little bit better on product market fit, when you can build those channel advantages and, and help people uh, buy the products the way they want to buy them, where, wherever that might end up being, uh, I, I think, I think that that points to a ton of success in the business and, and, and a ton more uh, around the corner, but I've, I've learned a ton from this interview. So thank yeah, you for, for, sure. uh, for, for sharing the insights. Ethan, did you have any additional takeaways? Well, yeah, I, I just, I, I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, you're saying really understanding what the business does and how, it, how, the, how it works. It becomes so important for, for me, what you've really done in this conversation is proven that the lines between technology and growth are, are, the, the, it, there is no line anymore. It's just a, it's just, it, it's all interconnected. Sean and I always talk about the importance of diagramming your, your value delivery engine. And you just said like, that's important on the technology side. That's important on uh, for the entire business. I think you, you said, what have you learned about your role in growth? Sean loves when I, I, I mentioned this, but like when I started at Teltech right before I, I was at his house and we were chatting and I was like, Hey, give me one piece of advice in my, and he said, figure out everyone's role in growth. And I think what you've just said is that like, you've got to figure out your own role in growth, but you got to figure out how that works as part of this larger connected system. And I, you know, I, I just love the, the idea that Harry's, you know, you keep talking about how just disruptive the think the mindset is and like that, that concept of embracing the mammoth. Um, I, I love that as a, as a, as a, just as a, as a phrase, but um, we just recently spoke to um, the president of uh, the San Jose Sharks. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, pioneering, like pioneering sports and entertainment. That's what he, he sees as, as the future. And I think if, you know, if you want to be bold and successful, you got to be bold and, and take these, these big risks and not be afraid to try new things. So um, I think it all ties together really nicely. And um, you've definitely, yeah, I think maybe a little bit of me was like, oh, we're talking to a CTO. That's different from what we normally do. And I'm wondering how that'll, you know, pan out. Like, uh, it wasn't like talking to a CTO or, uh, or maybe it, it is, but uh, it's a lot like just talking about growth. So very cool stuff. Awesome, man. Happy to be here. And by, and by the way, our products are awesome too. So it, it, it's, they, 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 they sell themselves and then people are hooked on them. So if you haven't tried our razors, a body, I definitely <laughs> recommend it. I'm a, so how, I'm a, how would one I, go about trying them? Yeah. Well, ha Harry's.com or, or I will send you free samples, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever works. But, but yeah, I, I, I joke about this a lot. Uh, I, I am obsessed with our body wash. It is. And it's something we just launched two years ago. So. Super cool. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you smell better than I do from here. <laughs> As Sean's pretty much everybody does um, <laughs> but uh yeah th thank you so much cindy for, for just giving us that perspective of uh of growth from the from the cto seat at harry's um it's uh it's it's eye-opening for for me and i'm uh i'm going to definitely be recommending this episode to a lot of the ctos yeah. that i know because i think it um it's just it, it shows the future of where, where things are headed and um and it's fun. I think it's. I think it's something that um, business is pretty pretty cool. And when when people can can think about the big picture of the business and how they can contribute to that, I think it, it actually brings a lot more more meaning and and enjoyment to the to, to the whole thing um, for for people in their day to day work. So again, part of that move toward hybrid and 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 even fully remote um, when you when you have that connection to the to the bigger mission and and. And, and you have appreciation for what you're doing uniquely in the business, I think it's a lot easier to, to find that, that energy uh, and enthusiasm to, 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 to put your heart and soul into the work on a day-to-day -day sure. basis. So um, thank you for sharing that and uh, really excited to be watching what you guys are doing. And I am, I'm going to be trying a lot of the products, um, the, uh, the cat food. We don't have a cat, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, he's going to try it anyway. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I will try the women's products. Um, yeah. Sometimes they're better, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but awesome. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank we'll, you. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to, to getting this episode out as quickly as possible. Thanks for having me.